I don't want to go to school just to learn to be a parent and recite a silly rule. If growing up means it would be beneath my dignity to climb my tree, I'll never grow up, never grow up, never grow up, not me. I won't grow up. I don't want to wear a tie. And the spirit is expression in the middle of July. And if it means I must prepare to shoulder burdens with a worried air, I'll never grow up, never grow up, never grow up. So there, never gonna be a man, I won't like to see somebody try and make me anyone who wants to try and make me turn into a man. <laughs> Catch me if you can. I won't grow up. Not a penny will I pitch. I will never grow a mustache <laughs> or a fraction <laughs> of an inch. Cause growing up is awfuler than all the awful things that ever Never grow up, never grow up. No, sir, not me. So there. <laughs> Good evening, and welcome to Father John Sings. I'm Father John. <clears throat> and you know, in, in an airline, before they take off, they have these security safety announcements that they have to make that are required by law. Now, we don't have any seat belts here, although some people did ask about them when they came in. But we do have safety announcements that we have to make in this facility before we can really start. So, voice in the sky, take it away! Welcome to the Allen County Public Library Theater. For your safety, please take a moment to locate the emergency fire exits. There are three fire exits, one at the left front of the theater and two at the back of the theater. In the event of a fire alarm, please exit through one of these doors. Follow the illuminated emergency exit signs until you are safely out of the building. If you are handicapped and cannot use the stairs, please wait in front of the public elevator adjacent to the theater lobby. Emergency fire personnel have been instructed to meet and assist you there. Thank you for your attention and enjoy the program. Thank you. Music! has been a part of my life ever since I was born. My mother used to say that when I was a small child, I would sing myself to sleep. Oh, I, true, true, true. My father's family was from Schenectady, upstate New York, and grandfather uh, ran a plumbing and construction business, and he built the Carmelite Monastery in Schenectady. And when the monastery was opened, and this was in the newspapers, middle of January, Schenectady, snow up to your waist, the scent of roses could be smelled for blocks around. Well, my father took over when my father, my grandfather died and he ran the business and he used to say with a certain amount of pride, only three men are allowed into the cloister of the Carmelites, the bishop and the doctor and the plumber. <laughs> he was the plumber. But at that time in the church, some wise soul in Rome had decided that until you got to the age of seven, you did not have the age of reason, and so you couldn't commit a sin. Now, I don't know if you remember when you were like at six, but that was a very silly thing. But what it meant was that I, since I was under seven, I could go into the cloister and visit with the Carmelite sisters, who could remember my father singing at Mass for them many years before. And my mother used to tell the story of standing outside with the rest of the family and listening to my beautiful voice soprano voice coming over the grill. And I know that this is one of the songs that I sang for the nuns. And if you know the chorus, you're welcome to join in. Imagine it with a voice soprano voice. I'm not going to try to do that one. <laughs> How much is that doggy in the window? No one. <laughs> There's always one. <laughs> it comes later. <laughs> How much is that doggy in the window? The one with the waggly tail. How much is that doggy in the window? I do hope that dog is for sale. 
I must take a trip to California and leave my poor sweetheart alone. If she has a dog, he will protect her, and the dog he will have a good home. How much is that dog in the window? You got it. The one with the waggling now. How much is that dog in the window? I do hope that dog is for sale. I read in the paper there are robbers with flashlights that shine in the dark. If she has a dog, he will protect her. And the dog he will have and scare them all away with one bark. How much is that dog in the window? The one with the waggly tail. How much is that dog in the window? I do hope that dog is for sale. I don't want a bunny or a kitty. I don't want a parrot who can talk. I don't want a bowl of little goldfish. You can't take a goldfish for a walk. How much is that dog in the window? The one with the waggly tail. How much is that dog in the window? Big finish. I do hope that dog is for sale. soprano voice and it was apparently quite lovely. There are a couple of recordings of it still around. And when people used to come, you know, to visit the great cocktail parties, my parents would drag me out and dust me off and I would sing. I sang at Radio City Music Hall for the Christmas show one year, back in the days when it was a vaudeville house. You had the movie and the Christmas show and the nativity scene and the orchestra and the organs coming out from the walls. And we did like six shows a day, you know. I was a guest artist with the Columbus Boy Choir School. So I've been singing most of my life. And I studied with some interesting people along the way, but in 1967, I met Charles Redding, who probably did more to influence my life than any other single human being. Charles was the assistant to Giuseppe De Luca, uh, De Luca, the great metropolitan opera baritone. And I studied with Charles from 1967 until his death in 2010. And one of the songs that we sang thousands of times, it was our exercise piece. We sang it high, we sang it low, we sang it fast, we sang it nasal, we sang it deep, we sang it all sorts of things. I must have sung this song thousands, literally thousands of times. It is the most asked for song at weddings. And so I'm going to sing it now while I'm in the suit. You didn't know I had a suit like this, did you? <laughs> Many priests don't these days. They're wonderful. You get up in the morning, you don't worry about what you put on. As long as you've got underwear, everything else is right there. <laughs> Remember Jackie Gleason? Yeah. Yes. How sweet it is.
I love applause. But Monday night I ran the show and it went until about 8.05, which is great. Then I suddenly realized I had not accounted for applause. So if I cut you off, it's not that I don't love it, it's just that I'm watching the clock, right? Um, when I was about to be ordained, don't panic, I've got clothes on under here. <laughs> I mean, I may not see much without my glasses, but I can see fear. <laughs> when I was to be ordained, Father Provincial sent a note to all of the men who were preparing for ordination, and he said, uh, you have my permission to go out and buy a good black suit. Well, I was going to Nigeria, and I somehow did not think a black suit was something I was going to get a lot of use out of, four degrees off the equator. So I wrote him and said, could I have your permission to instead get a good white dress cassock, you know, with the white sleeves and the buttons and all. He said, yes. So it's about 300 bucks, you know. And this was 1992, 300 bucks, you know. So I got it and I wore it. And the first time I really wore it was when I was being introduced to Archbishop, now Cardinal Okoji, to get my faculties and let him know there was a priest in the diocese. And I'm sitting there and we're chatting away and we did very well. And at one point he looked up at me and he said, ah, I see you want to be a bishop. <laughs> and I thought maybe the suit was too fancy, you know, with the buttons and all. And I said, Your Grace? And he pointed to my ring, which was from the University of Notre Dame. And I said, Oh no, Your Grace, this is my university ring. I said, No smart man wants to be a bishop. <laughs> <laughs> you can tell why I am not in the Vatican diplomatic service. <laughs> However, at the end of the interview, I reached out to shake his hand. I wasn't big on kissing rings. Well, he took and he kissed my ring. Oh. So I knew we'd be all right, right? I had a friend, a Jesuit, who was down in Jamaica and was, was made a bishop. And after, shortly after his elevation, one of these gushing women came up to him, said, oh, bishop, may I have the privilege of kissing your ring? And he said, of course, my dear, it's in my back pocket. Oh. <laughs> True story. True story. I think I think I was a friend of mine. When I was growing up, I was very fortunate because my grandmother had a ticket man who could get you a ticket for anything. And I had a grandmother who had money, which didn't hurt either. And the next Broadway show, well, the first Broadway show I ever saw, by the way, was the first song I sang. The opening song that I sang was from Peter Pan. Mary Martin, Cyril Richard, people flying through the air. And it was meant, we went to a matinee. And we were living in New Jersey by that point, but we were staying with my grandmother in New York. And when the show was over, I went back to the apartment, and it was winter time, it was dark. And I went off into the spare bedroom. I didn't turn the lights on, and I sat on the bed. And I cried, and I cried, and I cried like my heart was gonna break. Because that beautiful, beautiful, magnificent thing was going to happen again that night, and I was never going to see it again. And it, it broke my heart. And that was when I fell in love with theater. And my grandmother made sure I got to see plays. And so the next big play I saw was My Fair Lady, front row, center of the balcony, Rex Harrison, Julie Andrews, Stanley Holloway, and Robert Coote as Pickering. Now, at that point, I knew I wanted to spend my life in theater, thank you very much. And so I wrote fan letters to all of them. And in those days, they all wrote back. Stanley Holloway, Rex Harrison, Julie Andrews, and Robert Coote wrote a handwritten note on New York Athletic Club stationery. My grandfather had been a member of the New York Athletic Club, so I immediately wrote back. Well, he didn't know my grandfather, but he knew people who knew my grandfather. And in later years, I became chaplain for the New York Athletic Club for several years. So Robert Coop and I kept in touch, right? And this was a song from My Fair Lady. And it ties into a longer story. I'll keep going for the next couple of songs. When I went to see a show, my parents always made sure I had the records ahead of time so I knew all the music, except for this one song. I heard this song on the radio once, and I knew it. Absolutely cold. I don't know what it is. It's never happened to me before or since. But I heard this song once, and I knew it. And so I sing it. It's also a love song, and I don't get to sing those much. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.
which I was proud to be a member of for many years. And even before that, because I was growing up in Princeton, I had a crush on Susan Lerner. She never knew, which was probably good for both of us. Anyway, Robert Troop finished his run in My Fair Lady. He went back to England. And then I got a letter from him. He said he was coming back to the United States to do a musical called Camelot. And would I be interested in coming up to go to a rehearsal? Well, yeah. <laughs> so I show up, and I get to meet Julie Andrews and Richard Burton and Robert Goulet, and I hear all of the stories, and I go around. Uh, Bob Coop played King Pelinor. If you've seen the show, it's the lost king who wanders in with the big furry dog, right? It was a great role. One of the stories that I heard that day was that when they first started rehearsal, and they do read-throughs, they sit around the big table and they read through the scripts to get used to it. And when they'd have a break, Goulet would go this way and Burton would go the other way. They wouldn't talk to each other. And finally, apparently, Julie Andrews said, enough is enough, in her wonderful English accent, and took Bob Goulet by the hand and marched him over to Burton and said, now you two talk to each other. Well, what was happening was, Bob Goulet was the great Canadian baritone, world famous singer. He was gonna have to act on stage with Richard Burton, one of the great actors of our age. Burton, one of the great actors of our age, was going to have to sing on stage with Robert Goulet. They were scared of each other. <laughs> this is one of the songs that Burton sang. Gentlemen, pay attention.
Florence Olivier, one of the great productions of our time. And I got a ticket, and I went to see it. Before the show, I sent my business card around by the stage door. I said, you won't remember me, but I met you at a Camelot rehearsal with Bob Cooch. I'd like to come backstage. Worth a shot, right? So after the show, I went to the stage door. Oh, yes, Mr. Sheehan, your name's on the list. So I went right back. There were only three or four people in the dressing room with Burton. And so we're sitting and we're talking, and he's getting changed. And finally, he said, well, a couple of the lads and I are going out for a drink. Would you want to come? <laughs> Would I want to go drinking with Richard Burton? <laughs> that may have been the fastest answer to a question I ever gave. <laughs> Fast forward, it's about 4 o'clock in the morning. We are, yeah, you know where this is going, right? There was a bar on 8th Avenue between 43rd and 44th Street. It was a long, narrow bar, and at the back was a big round table, and we'd all been sitting around the table, and we were well and truly drunk, Mr. Burton more so than the rest of us, but we had more experience. <laughs> and he started to tell stories about growing up in Wales, and about his father, well, not his stepfather, but his father singing to him. And this was the man who was scared to sing with Robert Goulet, and he starts singing these lullabies. And I can remember, through my drunken haze, thinking, why isn't somebody filming this? It was gorgeous. He sang for probably 40 minutes or more. And at the end of it, I mean, we were done. What do you do? Everybody went home. I staggered down to Port Authority bus terminal and got the 6 o'clock bus back to New Jersey. You know. So that's my story about drinking with Richard Burton. <laughs> Um, what's next? Oh, this one, okay. When I first went to New York, <coughs> when I first went to New York, I was a tenor. And I very quickly realized that I was a young actor and I was going to shorten fat. Well, tenors are heroes and lovers and princes. <laughs> so I figured if I was going to work, I better develop middle voice and lower voice. And this was one of the great gifts that Charles Redding gave to me was this ability to sing not only different notes, but with different colors. <coughs> when I first, my first professional job in New York, I was singing with the light opera of Manhattan, doing Gilbert and Sullivan. In the first act, I was a first tenor pirate. In the second act, I was a second base policeman. <laughs> they thought I was pretty good stuff. We'll see how this song goes. This is one of the great bass songs.
assurance, I shall tell you as he did, and you will know why. Though I probably shall not explain as I die. Ah, widow, tit, widow, tit, widow. Thank you. 
and I did not tell my mother I went home at Christmas. And the airport in Salisbury, Maryland at that time was slightly smaller than this auditorium. She walked right past me. I reached out and tapped her on the shoulder. Remember me, your firstborn? Hello. There are some shows for which you shave, and when you do that, you discover that nobody notices. I once, uh, before we made the long retreat as novices, we all decided that we were going to grow beards. I had, a, I had a beard, so, so I shaved. I was in Xavier High School in New York. I was doing a, a, an experiment, and I decided I would shave half of it. <laughs> Nobody noticed. <laughs> I, I went a full day. I was uh, in rehearsal for Man of La Mancha, and I was doing Sancho, and I thought, well, I probably should shave. I had a mustache and goatee. And, you know, so people would get used to my Sancho face before we hit the road. And at the end of rehearsal one day, we were all changing clothes, and we were going off to a bar for a drink, and somebody said, well, you know, John, I really like your face without the beard. And one of the dancers said, that's it. I knew something was different. <laughs> <laughs> However, Fiddler on the Roof is one of those shows for which you need a beard. I've done three productions of Fiddler. I was Laser Wolf the Butcher. I was the Commissar. I did a couple of other small things. Every production I went out, I understudied Tevye. Never did him once. Such a healthy bunch of Tevyas you've never seen. <laughs> the key to Tevya, it's like a, a, another show. Um, the funny thing happened on the way to the forum. Pseudolus and Tevya are very, very closely related. They're parts that are written for actors that can be huge and big and extravagant and go everywhere, and then all of a sudden bring it into reality. And if you can't do that, don't do the show. And Zero Mostel was wonderful. Um, how did a uh, funny thing happen? It was written for Phil Silvers, who was another one of those actors who could do that. Yaha! The key to Tevya is God. God for Tevya is what ties everything together. And when he talks about, if I were a rich man, toward the end of the song, there's a line, if I were rich, I'd have the time that I lack to sit in the synagogue and pray and maybe have a seat by the Eastern Wall. And I discuss the holy books with the learned men seven hours every day. This would be the sweetest thing of all. And that's the core to Tevye. Other than that, he's just like the rest of us. He wants to protect his family. He wants it should be a little better in life. It wouldn't hurt if his wife had some.
sung this song in concert any number of times. And I always have trouble remembering the words. And my grandmother, my father's mother, was a great singer. And she was so good, they wanted her to sing at the Metropolitan Opera. Gadi Krasaza was the head of the opera at that point. And my grandfather said, no, a woman only sings at church or in the home. And so she did. She sang at church and she sang at home. Now, John McCormick, the great Irish singer, loved to sing with my grandmother. And he would take the train from New York up to Schenectady. And at the 11 o'clock mass at St. John the Divine Church, the two of them, after mass, the mass was over and everybody would settle back into their seats. And John McCormick and my grandmother would sing for an hour. And they had printed programs for this. One of the things about John McCormick, oh dear, well, let's see what happens. I was going to tell you the story about John McCormick. One of the things about him was when he was first starting out as a singer, he was on stage and he forgot the words. And it so traumatized him that any time he sang a recital, he always had the words in his hand. And I was going to tell you that story and explain why I was holding the words for this song. I left them backstage. <laughs> well, if there are any opera fans in the audience, we'll see what happens. Uh, this is a song from La Traviata. And in the second act, the father sings to his son, who is carrying on with a notorious woman, and the father is not pleased. Now, the woman actually is, is quite good, but he doesn't know that. And so he's trying to bring the son back to his senses and talks about the, the times when they had Provence and the harm that he's done, and he keeps praying to God that he will bring him back. I pray to God I can remember the words.
the first brilliant young director. And at one point in rehearsal, he took the man who was playing Cervantes and Don Quixote. And he took him off and he said, look, we're going to work on the impossible dream today. And this is, of course, a dream song for a baritone. You plant yourself down stage center and you sing the impossible dream. He said, no, 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 no. Quixote sings this song. The old man with the spear who tilts at windmills. This is not Cervantes, the big young baritone. And I want you to sing this like an old man because I want the people to hear the words. Often when this song is sung, everybody's so busy listening to the voice. They miss the words. Well, the baritone was not thrilled, but he did it. And it made such great sense. By the way, you know what this is? I did, I'd forgotten that I had this. This is a Pavarotti nail. There's an old Italian opera tradition that Pavarotti was wedded to it. He would not go on until he had found a bent nail backstage. And every opera house around the world, there was one technician whose sole job was to make sure there were enough bent nails that Pavarotti would find one. <laughs> and this is a Pavarotti nail from the Metropolitan Opera House. some of what I put into this song I stole from whoever that was, but a lot of it is mine as well. And you may find yourself. Yeah. 
And French was a very useful language. Ma mère m'a toujours dit que tout le monde civilisé parle français. My mother always used to say, the civilized world speaks French. Everybody speaks French. I did my sophomore year at university in Innsbruck, Austria. And during our semester break, I was riding across the southern part of France in a train. And it was a local, and it was pre pretty much all day. It was an interesting day to do it, because it was the day de Gaulle announced that he wanted all of the NATO forces out of France. And so people would come into the car and they would discover I was an American. You know, these were the European cars with little compartments like Hogwarts, right? And um, I, I got to practice my French a lot that day. Well, one, at one point, this very old man came in with a nurse. And he sat down and he would periodically come out and then go back into whatever world he was in. I was standing in the corridor at one point watching the world go by. And he came out and he was in one of his coherent modes. Now, he was from the southern part of French, and so the accent was very much deep in the throat, right? But we chatted for a while, and then he kind of wandered off, and I got the nurse, and she tucked him in. And I said to her, did I understand him correctly? She, oh, yes. When he was a young man, he had helped build the Eiffel Tower. Oh. Thank you. This is why my mother said you should speak French. <laughs> this is in French. I remember the first time I heard this song, I was at home. And the Ed Sullivan show was on, and I was in the bathroom downstairs. And I heard this voice coming out, and I ran out. It was the first time I ever heard Edith Piaf. And this is one that she made famous. several special projects for Marines, both overseas and in New York City. One of the proudest things I own is a plaque I got from the Marines with a piece of the barracks glued onto it from the Beirut bombing. Um, 
This is a prayer, and it is a prayer that is appropriate for anyone who has a loved one who is in danger. It doesn't have to be military, doesn't have to be high risk, just anyone who is has a loved one who is in danger. This is for them. songs I sang at this concert. <laughs> I mean, the first time I did this, that's what people did. They said, oh, I want to hear the Ave Maria again. You know, I try not to repeat, because there's so much literature out there. So pick two songs. I will not look at the slips until I have decided on a program. But if I pick songs that you have picked, you get a free ticket. And if you pick two songs that I picked, you get two free tickets. <laughs> and even if you don't, you will get advance notice of my concert and a nice discount or coming back, so there you are. There are pens outside, and there's a box. 
and you can put your slips into the box. You can also put money into the box, too, <laughs> but it's really for slips. You don't have to put money in the box. But remember, if there's any profit in this adventure, and I think there will be some, uh, it all goes to St. Vincent de Paul, which is a marvelous organization. And, you know, it's a widow's mite, but it's a nice little mite, and so... <laughs> <laughs> Hello, yes. Um, so take papers. If you see paper, even if it's not yours, please take it. If there are uncollected seat reserved signs either next to you or behind your back, please take them with you so that there's nothing left. The library has been very good to us, and if there's, I have to walk the rows anyway to be sure there's nothing left, so please take them with you. As you leave, there are cookies. Everybody gets a cookie. And if you look carefully at the cookie, it has my face on it. <laughs> it takes the old expression, eat me, to a whole new dimension. In fact, there are two different kinds of me on it, so pick the face you like the best. I don't know. They're actually, they're really good cookies. It's kind of a novelty, but they taste really good. So let's see. Clean up after yourself. Eat the cookies. Put the slip in the box. Oh, and do me a favor, would you? I mean, I'm an unknown quantity. Nobody knows who I am. That's why I put YouTube links on all my publicity. Over the next week or two, be sure to tell all your friends what they missed. <laughs> you know. Now, the library is filming this, and it will be on their APC station network, however that works. I don't know. Um, if I do know, I'll try to let people know. Although you've seen it, why would you want to see it again? I'm dying to see it, you know, see what I said. <laughs> Uh, this is the last song, and it connects to the first song. Remember, the first song was from Peter Pan. And I was so in love with theater that night, I just thought my heart would break. I said, and it was true, that when we get guests, my parents would dust me off, and I would go out as a voice soprano and sing. You know, I sang at the AOC Music Hall. I was an understudy for AMO when NBC was doing the live broadcast. But my father was in television. And at one point, he had, then he was in advertising, and he had the Texaco account. And so one of his jobs was to take people to the Texaco box for the Metropolitan Opera. And we had all sorts of people come to the house. Maury Amsterdam was an old friend. Art Carney would come over and play double piano with my father. And some of these people I knew, and some I didn't. And apparently, Mary Martin and her husband had been at a cocktail party and had heard me sing. And her husband was the producer who produced Peter Pan. And he called up my father and he said, John, we're doing this production with Mary and Saru Richard, and young John would be perfect to be one of the lost boys. <laughs> my parents said no. <laughs> they didn't tell me about this until after I graduated from high school. Now, I love my parents. <laughs> I had a very good relationship with my parents. I really did. I seriously considered running away from home. The reason I didn't was that I thought I'd probably get away with it. <laughs> <laughs> but Peter Pan is a magical bit of theater. But theater at its best, theater at its best, does what I would hope church at its best should do. I have a long story about that that I'll try to tell in my next concert. Um, but church, I mean, we have the most exciting message in the world, and we tell it so badly for the most part. Theater, theater touches hearts, it touches minds, it changes perspectives, it brings people together into community, which is what church should do. And when you listen to the words of this song, at least to me, it reminds me of another place where the same description holds true. I know a place where dreams are born and time is never planned. It's not on any chart. You must find it with your heart. Never, never land. It might be miles beyond the Just keep an open mind, and then suddenly you'll find Never, never land You'll have a treasure if you stay there Precious more far than gold For once you have found your way there You may never, never grow old 
are born. And time is never planned. Just think of lovely things, and your heart will fly on wings forever. Joyce Brothers. Really? He went to Mary Lou Lewis. 
I was going to say he went to Notre Dame, but his wife is smarter than he is. <laughs> what was the category? Boxing. Boxing. Wow. Dr. Joyce Brothers, the great psychotherapist, of course, did boxing. Well, anyway, my parents were married at St. Patrick's Cathedral. They went to the Waldorf for the wedding breakfast. My father stood up and announced he was going to sing to his bride. My mother reports she was terrified. <laughs> she didn't know he could sing. Now, he'd been singing since college. He had a band. He was on radio, you know, but somehow this had not come up in their courtship. You know, I gathered that at that point, my father, unlike his firstborn son, was not given into bursting into song at every hour. And so he stood up and he sang this song. Now, the song is to Mary, the Rose of Tralee. But my father decided that if he was going to have a long and happy married life, he probably should sing it to Gracie, since my mother's name was Grace. One of my CDs is called uh, Father John Sings Sacred Songs, and on it, Amazing Grace is twice. You know, same song, but different versions. And people will ask me, Father, 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 why, why is Amazing Grace twice on the CD? And my only answer is, well, my mother's name is Grace. I sang this once. I was booked to do an evening. It was St. Patrick's. And one of the good jazz clubs just outside of New Hope, Pennsylvania, booked me and a pianist to do an evening. I did like four sets. And my mother came. And she's sitting at the table. And I start to sing this song. And I realize it was the first time I had sung it since my father died. Almost didn't get through that one. <laughs> The sun was reclining beneath the blue sea when I strayed with my love to the pure crystal fountain that lies neath the beautiful veil of Trani, for she's tender and fair as the rose of the summer that was not her. into song like no other people. And this is a song 
that is about one of the great moments in the life of an Irishman, a traumatic moment, a dramatic moment, something that sears an Irishman's heart to the very soul. It's a pub closing song. <laughs> Oh, all the money that e'er I spent, I spent it in good company. And all the harm that e'er I done, alas, it was to none but me. And what I done for want of wit, to memory now I can't recall. So Good night, God bless, and safe home.